If you have your Bibles with you, please turn to Isaiah chapter 52, verse 13. That's up on page 741 on the church Bibles. We're going to read Isaiah 52, verse 13, all the way to Isaiah chapter 53, at verse 12. Uh, whether you're joining us online or in person, we're thrilled to open the word of God. So why don't I read to us? Isaiah 52, verse 13. The suffering and the glory of the servant. See, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. Just as there were many who, appalled at, who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being and his form marred beyond human likeness. So he will sprinkle many nations and kings will shut their mouths because of him. For what they were not told, they will see. And what they have not heard, they will understand. Chapter 53. Who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and the root out of dry ground. He has no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised and we held him in, long, in, in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that, was, that brought us peace was on him and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was punished. He was assigned the grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering, for, and though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, for he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you very much, Eric. Um, my name is Chris. I'm on the staff team here. It's wonderful that you're here this afternoon. And we have got the word of the Lord open. Please do keep your Bibles open if you're able to, or your phones to Bible view. Uh, let's pray before we come to this. Father, as we come to your word, change us, mold us, show us your wisdom that we may bring you glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, We've got a fabulous passage here, and we're going to have some really exciting, helpful things to see how to live life for the Lord. But first, let me tell you a story. Once upon a time, true story, once upon a time, my family and I were driving down the country lanes of North Wales to go to Word Alive. Word Alive is happening at the moment. Uh, this was a few years ago, so there were the four of us in the car. And you're driving along, and it's beautiful scenery. You know those things called, sort of called hedges and fields and horizon and things that you can see out in the countryside? You could see those. You could also see sheep in the, in the, uh, the fields around. But if you get further into the countryside, something happens to the country lanes. I don't know if you, re you realize this, but you, actually they get narrower, and the hedges get higher and higher. And they sort of can end up this sort of height. But people are just driving around them, as fast as they possibly can. I was driving along, trying to be quite careful, but not take forever, yeah? And coming around a country lane, and in the middle of this lane, with the hedges high, was a little lamb. It's lambing season at the moment. Little lamb, middle of it, screeched to a halt. I didn't hit the lamb, don't worry. 
Yeah, that would be a bad one, wouldn't it? But yeah, didn't hit the lamp. And we're looking around. We all four got out, trying to work out how is this lamb in the road. Well, we could hear it bleating. We could hear some sheep on the side of the hedge. How did it get there? We're sort of wandering around looking. There's four of us trying to keep this sheep relatively safe. One sort of keeping an eye for any, any cars coming so they didn't mow us down. Yeah? And then actually we found right around the corner, down a pathway, there was a gate. And under the gate, there was a gap. And clearly it had come that way. Now it took all four of us a fair bit of time of cajoling to get this sheep to go in the right direction. Once it spotted the hole, boof, off. Off to mummy. Now, I'm not quite sure what was going on in the field, but there's an awful lot of barring going on when I arrived back. I have a feeling what sort of conversation might have been going on. That sheep had gone astray, had turned to his own way. Yeah? Segue there. You like it? Okay. Now, but there's more to that. We are more like that sheep, that lamb, than we would like to admit. If we put that into life's decisions. We can come, and it's be like a country lane with hedges high. You've got a decision. Do I do this thing, that thing, this thing, or go that way? Early on, you, it might that look like a wide road or a dirt path. You're not quite sure. You, if you knew what was at the end of the path, the end of that decision, you'd know which decision to make. But we don't know what's at the end of the decision. We only have the view that we have at this point in time. Retrospect is not available. So we need wisdom to make decisions. Wisdom to know which path to take. This passage we're going to look at, God's wisdom is revealed. There's going to be two major headings. Power shown through suffering and love through substitution. So first, God's wisdom revealed through power shown through suffering. This passage starts with, see my servant. So we're going to look and see who this is. And the Bible is really helpfully clear about who this servant is. So in Acts 8, there's Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. The Ethiopian was reading this very passage. Isaiah 53, 7 to 8 was open as he was reading it. And he asked, the, he asked Philip, who's this talking about? Verse 35, then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. So that's good for us because we know exactly who this servant is. The servant is Jesus. So the whole passage is showing us Jesus. When it says see, we're looking at Jesus. So let's look and see what God reveals about Jesus here. And the start's great. He will act wisely. Brill. The rest of Isaiah, the, the phrase raised and lifted up, is only used to speak of God. If you're taking notes, that's chapter 6, verse 1, and chapter 57, verse 15. So God himself is coming, and we're starting in triumph, raised and lifted up. A great wise hero come to secure his people. He's coming to save the people and will triumph. So anticipation is great. Look and see, what are we going to see? A noble statesman coming through the door. No. What does worldly wisdom look like? Now, I actually looked, this, looked up and Googled world's wisest person on Google. Didn't get very far. I got a brief search, showed clever people. Right? We know clever people aren't wise. If you come across some of the cleverest people, they don't necessarily do normal day-to-day -day things. Or there's different types of intelligence. So emotional or intellectual intelligence, but that's not the same as wisdom. That's not the same as knowing how to live life. People know they want wisdom to help and guide, but they have no worldly answer to pin it on. They're tossed by the waves of culture to and fro. They're lost. This passage in Isaiah is written to a people besieged by the most mighty empire of the day, that's the Assyrians. They were inside the gates, 
with the mighty commander sending belittling comments to them that they could all hear, and looking out from a human perspective, all is lost. They have no secure anchor. They need a mighty warrior saver here to come and rescue them. Now, just jumping back slightly, don't you find that today belittling and mockery of Christians is rife? Think about how you come across last week or might, might come across this week, different settings, whether that's here in the city or where you're going to work or school or university or family or friends that you may visit. Many ridiculers for our views. And the world looks strong and powerful. So how could we possibly survive? The Israelites are waiting for God's coming. And we're waiting for God's coming. So look out and see him coming. God is about to enter the scene. Wisdom is about to be shown to the world. The question is... Can we recognize it? Verse 14, many were appalled at him. His appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being and his form marred beyond human likeness. Verse 15, kings will shut their mouths. The greater the world will be overwhelmed by the servant. Now put it to you, that doesn't look right. That doesn't look like a warrior savior king coming to rescue his people. How, and how can you purify many nations with a sort of sprinkling of something? And by someone looks disfigured and marred, what sort of divine wisdom is this? Don't they and we need strength? I mean, we know we're weak. I certainly do. And we need someone who's strong and can overcome. But it's even worse. The people of God here in verse 14, they're appalled. So they see the servant as unclean. That's what that means. Yet he's going to be turning out to be the one who cleanses the people. It's a paradox so astounding that it'll dry up every accusation and cause every mouth to be stopped. The wisdom of God displayed in the servant will utterly confound human wisdom. So we're left reeling. The kings of the earth are gobsmacked. I mean, it doesn't compute. It makes no logical sense. It's like saying to the lamb in the lane in North Wales who just wants his mummy back and he's sitting there and this giant metal box turns up and these four two-legged things get out and shoo him around. It makes no sense. That's not what I'm looking for. That's not going to help. I want my mummy. It's not what I need. It all starts so well in the passage. It was triumphant, and now it's a mess. But we're using mankind's wisdom to look at the issue. I mean, what type of God do we want and expect in this situation? Magnificent, awesome, terrifying the enemy. Now, God is all those things. That's not how he shows up in this passage. God's wisdom does look does not look like mankind's wisdom. It can look upside down to us. So I ask you, what sort of wisdom are you looking for? Worldly, overt, big show wisdom? Or God's wisdom that looks like nothing to the world, yet is everything? God's wisdom can look very upside down to us. And as we look further on in chapter 53, verse 1, we see how this divine wisdom is revealed. The phrase, the arm of the Lord, would have been really clear to the Israelite readers. We just need a moment to orientate ourselves. So Exodus chapter 6, verse 6 says, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm, with mighty acts of judgment. It's God's saving power. Deuteronomy 5.15, remember that you were slaves in Egypt and that the Lord your God brought you out there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Again, God's saving power. Arm or holy arm or outstretched arm is used throughout Isaiah for God's saving power. So this power looks upside down. 
just like God's wisdom looks upside down, God's power is going to look upside down. Look, it arrives like a tender shoot, so it's quiet and unassuming. There is no beauty or majesty, power or attraction to bring us towards him. Notice, when people become heads of state or become important in a company or something, they start to try and look the part. They start to sort of try and act regal. Now, some get it and some, some don't, but this servant does not look the part. Notice he also, he suffered, had pain. People hid from him, despised. He was held in low esteem. People did not think much of him. Does this look like power? Does this look like a leader? Someone you want to follow, put your life in and decide what you're going to be doing in life. It doesn't look right. He doesn't behave right. He can't even sort his own suffering out. He's not highly regarded. He does not appear on the outside competent. If we were to look up these characteristics that we've just described on powerful people on Google, he would not show. He doesn't fit the seven habits of highly effective people at all. When you feel weak, you want a rescuer that at least looks the part and looks strong. Imagine the lamb in the lane. Now, I imagine that he would want a big Papa sheep, to come along and say, now then, son, what are you doing here? Don't let these people pull the wool over your eyes. Yeah, some of you are wondering whether I was going there or not. I'm going there, okay? That's a bad idea. And do come and you turn and I will shoo you the way Yeah, I'm getting groans. I'm liking it. Good. Just like you hearing these terrible puns, the lamb in the lane did not get what he was looking for. So where is this power? Where do we find the servant? Acts 8 told us it's Jesus, and John 12 reinforces that. John 12, 37. Even after Jesus had performed so many signs in their presence, they would still would not believe in him. This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah, the prophet. Lord, who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Now clearly this states that Jesus was the arm of the Lord. We see wisdom revealed is Jesus who brings divine power. But it comes in a way we don't expect. Jesus who suffered is God's power revealed. That is God's wisdom. Jesus who came to earth and was born to an unknown, insignificant family. His birth was thought to be summoned by illegitimate. None in the gospel accounts tell us how amazing he looked. He certainly didn't look kingly. I mean, the Romans even joked about it and mocked him by putting a crown of thorns on his head and an inscription on the cross. This is the king of the Jews. It was to ridicule him and God's people. No king looks like this. No king dies the worst criminal's death. He was despised and held in low esteem. This is what God has revealed through Isaiah as the arm of the Lord, God's saving power. God's wisdom is seen through Jesus' suffering. and That is what divine power looks like. Just take that in a moment. Suffering Jesus is what divine power looks like. That changes our relationship with suffering considerably. Let's work that through. God's almighty power is everlasting. If you want to see power, look at Jesus and look at his suffering. We've said mankind doesn't recognize this power. It's the power of eternal life. I mean, we understand misunderstand this it was misunderstood then we can easily fall for looking for power that looks powerful but worldly power is only fleeting it's like a shiny helium balloon tracking lots of attention is noticeable but pop it 
and there's nothing substantial inside. Are you looking for power in the wrong place? Are you looking for power by removing suffering? Are you looking for power revealed through suffering? That's a massive change in relationship with suffering. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 to 10. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. We can see that God's power is made perfect in our weaknesses. Now, have you noticed that we tend to feel closer to God when we feel weak? Closer to the power of the cross in our weakness than our strength. Let me explain. Don't you find you pray more or pray more earnestly when all is not well than when everything's fine? Do you read the Bible more earnestly and yearn for God more when you're feeling weak than when you're feeling strong? God is helping us to turn to him and not rely on ourselves. For example, this week, I have felt very weak. I have had a number of sermons to repair, meeting for people one-to-one, biblical counseling sessions, a final seminar essay, normal duties of coordination, going to Word Alive, preparing for that, and being on the pastoral care team, and getting back here. I have felt not able to go through that of myself at all. I felt weak and taken it to the Lord in prayer. And his loving power has sustained me through through the suffering, through the weakness, in helping me to trust that his grace is sufficient and his power is made perfect in my weaknesses. Seeing God through my weakness, well, that makes seeing God's power all the clearer. Why? Because there is no doubt in my mind as to who is making things happen this week because it's certainly not me. All the glory goes to him. As a Christian, we follow Jesus. and We follow the way of the cross. We follow the way of, the, of suffering like our Lord did. And that suffering could be great and clearly seen. Or it could be small and invisible to most. Often the big things are noticed, but little ones that come from places you don't expect. For example, being taken for granted at church. Are you pouring your life out for others? You've come in to help with hospitality again early, carrying stuff up and down, more steps than you think could it be possibly be imagined in a building. But that is the gift of Central Hall. Someone comes in late, grabs the cup that you've spent time, care, love and energy, grabs the cup, swigs it down, puts it in the bin, walks away, doesn't even acknowledge you. It's your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ hurting you. So you ask me, how is power shown through the suffering here. Well, God's power helps you to forgive, to have long suffering, to continue lovingly serve God's people. We in ourselves are not able to do this. That's just one example. There could be lots of different other ways you would see God's grace through that. That is God's power at work. You could see God's grace in each other. If you want to see God's power, look there. We're called to bear upon So we're called upon to bear our griefs and sorrows. The burdens of those around us, it's hard, but we're not to bear them alone. We are in a church body. We are God's people together. We're called to bear each other's griefs and sorrows, not just to grin and bear it alone. That's why we have small groups here at church, like our connect groups, where we can grow in Christ's likeness together. And one part is to bear one another's burdens. Are we looking for power in the wrong place? Does power need to look powerful? Here we see that Jesus' power is made perfect in sacrifice, in weakness, in suffering. 
God's wisdom is displayed in his power shown through suffering. 1 Corinthians 1.18, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. That same power is at work in you, Christian. The power that raised Jesus from the dead at work in you. Remember, it's God's power. So it may be working in you through your suffering rather than removing your suffering. We all want hard times to go away and for the pain to stop. Of course we do. We can think of our suffering as a hindrance or that our suffering shows that God does not care about me. Here we see Jesus suffered for us to rescue us from our sin. Here we see that God works through and in suffering. He did it in and through Jesus, and we are his followers, so don't be surprised that this is how his power is at work in you, to change you to be more Christ-like. And the second point, and it's a bit shorter, wisdom. Love shown through substitution. If you look down at the passage, look at the words he and our in the passage. So verse four, I'll start. He took up our pain or our suffering. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. By his wounds, we are healed. He is substituting in for us himself for us. Really? I mean, doesn't he know what I'm like? Well, yes, he does. He absolutely does. He knows you and me better than we know ourselves. He knows exactly what we're like. I mean, look, verse six, we're all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us turned to his own way. We like to do things our own way, don't we? That's who we are. So he knows us. We all know that we have not led led a perfect life. I mean, not even close. We all wander astray. This verse tells us that God knows us. He knows what we are like. And yet, the Lord has laid on him, him, the servant of the Lord, the revealed power of God, Jesus fully God, fully man, has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Jesus takes the punishment you and I deserve onto himself. I mean, why on earth Would God do that for me or for you? Because he loves you. Because he loves me. God is love and he loves you. This passage tells us, shows us that Jesus in his pain, suffering, punishment by God, his piercing, crushing wounds have brought those who believe peace. Peace in our relationship with God. We could never, ever have done that. We deserve what he got. He loves us and brings us peace with God. I mean, it does beg the question, why is this necessary? Some of you might be sitting there thinking, I'm not really at war with God. Why do I need this peace? I'm not even trying to be at war. So why are you talking about peace necessary? I mean, even if I've done something wrong, God's loving and forgiving. Can't he just forgive me? And get on with things. Well, God is loving and forgiving, but he's also just. And sin is really bad news. We Christians talk a lot about good news, but we need to understand the really bad news. What is sin? Sin is rejecting our ignoring God in the world that he created, rebelling against him by living without reference to him not living in accordance with his ways, and the punishment for sin is death. God is holy and just, so to be at peace with God means that we would need to be without sin, and the punishment for that is death. To shrug the shoulders and say it doesn't matter would not be just. So instead of punishing us, he paid the price for our sin. All his suffering was undeserved, yet he willingly, because of his great love for us, substituted himself in for us. 
He was led like a lamb to the slaughter and was silent. He was oppressed and afflicted like a sheep taken to the slaughter. Notice again the substitution imagery here. We start with a sheep wandering astray, and here we end with a lamb taken to slaughter. Jesus is taking our place. Willingly knowing what we're like. Jesus, fully knowing what we're like, came willingly to die for us. He doesn't deserve it. He doesn't defend himself. Why? Because he loves you. Just take this in a moment. Jesus loves you. He knows you, really knows you. Knows you more than anyone here. He knows you're not perfect. He knows you've done wrong. He loves you so much, he's taken your punishment, the punishment we all deserve. And through this, we can have peace with God. All you need do is believe in Jesus. Believe that he has done this for you, the real you, and he will save you, the warts and all you. Peace, peace with God through Jesus is available for those who believe in Jesus. Now that is divine wisdom, power, and love. I mean, for the lamb in the lane, it would look like us putting ourselves in the road, lying down in danger, and the lamb immediately taken to safe pastures. When we look ourselves at the lanes and the hedges of life, the decisions that we've got, we can feel lost and alone. This passage reveals that our sin, that we kid ourselves, that we can just suddenly decide things for ourselves, it means our sin is worse than we can possibly imagine. That's the bad news. But the good news is that Jesus' wisdom is far, far better than we could ever dream of. We have Jesus whose wisdom is wiser than the world's, who shows God's power through suffering and his love through substitution. We have seen that this is through God's wisdom, and that's very, very different than human wisdom. That Jesus' suffering showed his almighty power. There's a massive change of relationship with suffering and is a massive comfort to what comes in the end. And that Jesus would substitute himself for you, for me, knowing the warts and all of us. Are you going to be the lamb in the lane, running away from rescue, looking for something that looks powerful, Get away from suffering at all costs and be self-sufficient. Have all the glory for yourself. Or are you going to look in the right place for true wisdom? Jesus. This is God's wisdom. Jesus showed God's full power through his suffering on the cross. Jesus showed his love for his people by substituting himself for you. Let me just repeat that. Jesus showed his full, God's full power through his suffering on the cross. Jesus showed his love for his people by substituting himself for you. And we know that is all for God's glory. Let's pray. Father, we are worse sinners than we could imagine, yet your wisdom is far more than we could imagine. That suffering would show your saving power, that you would love us, the real warts and all us, knowing us, that you would substitute yourself for us, Lord. That you would become sin for us, that you would take our blame and bear our wrath. What a love. What a cost that we would stand forgiven at the cross. The only response we can have is to worship you and give you all the glory. Amen.